an artist and a chef teamed up to provide scholarships to students attending art institutes and culinary schools. This is their podcast. DC in Two Perspectives is hosted by Tina Whitlow and Sean Lightfoot. Hey, Sean. What's up, Tina? So I was reading this article um, that was written a while ago, but it was an article of Barack Obama. There was a picture, and it was showing him talking to a young boy, and in the article it read how Barack Obama visited, visits the school and encourages young men to read and write and use that as an outlet for um, behavior issues that they may be dealing with in school. And uh, reading the article, further it spoke about Miguel Copeland and he is a young author. He's 13 years old and he's written a series of books called The Adventures of Firemen. Cool. So the book is about... Um, a superhero that he created and basically how the superhero, you know, fights crime. He has a partner and it's a really, really awesome story. And he wrote it when he was eight years old. He's 13 now. Wow. So we invited Miguel and his mom, his mom, him and his mom, they are a partner. They are a mom and son team duo and uh, they write books together and they publish them together also. So we invited both of them to come read at our annual Book Bash event. And the Book Bash event is a annual event that the Whitlow Foundation hosts. And we invite families. Basically, the basis of the event is that we want to encourage families to read to their children and make reading fun. And also encourage to older youth that reading can be fun. And during the Book Bash event, we like to make the environment very festive. We have music. We have a ton of books that kids can take home with them. We have snacks. And we have a reading carpet also. And uh, we like to invite families to come to to the event, pick out books that are age-appropriate for their children, also sit and listen to the storyteller, and also take home how you can read to your children, and make reading fun. Yeah, it just brings me back to my childhood <clears throat> when reading was pretty much all you had because we didn't have technology. So you didn't have Androids and iPhones and tablets to distract you from literacy. So that's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it takes me back to reading to my son every night. Um, I started reading to him even before he was born. When I was pregnant, I would read to him, and when as soon as he was born, I read bedtime stories to him every night. And it's a part of our routine. After bath time, I let him pick out a story, and I read him a book. And then he sleeps. Sometimes he picks out two stories, and most time he wants to read the same book every night. But it's great because now he's three years old, and he is able to recognize some of the words you know, in the book, or his favorite book is um, called Colors Train and um, by Dusty Wrinkler. And in the book, um, there are pictures of the word written in the color that, it's, that it is. So there's a picture of the word green written in green. He's able to recognize that, you know, based off of me reading it to him all the time. And he's identifying things. Right. And he's able to recognize the word in other places, too. So he's definitely on track with um, recognizing words, helping him with his literacy and, you know, reading. And he's only three. And I like to encourage that to parents to read to their children as early as possible. Yeah, that's one of the things I heard earlier at this um, uh, conversation. Excuse me, the conversation that uh, an ex NFL player was having with someone, and he was like, You know, why do people walk up to kids and the first thing they say is, What sports do you play versus what books do you read? Reading is extremely important. And I'm not even sure if I read to my kids because I sang to them. You sang to them? Oh, yeah, I sang to my kids. Um, <clears throat> back in the day, I had a pretty good voice. Um, but I do believe. They were read to because, you know, uh, I guess through reading and 
being able to articulate. You know, you had to read first. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, these events that we do, like the Book Bash and other events that we'll do you know, in the future, will definitely be important to um, having parents and kids participate in, and participate as a family. Mm -hmm. So us reading to our children for all parents is a way for us to connect with our kids at their level. It's a way for us to create child-centered time to engage with them and make them feel like I value what you want to do. I value what you want to read. I value what you're interested in. So how many kids do you have, Sean? I have four kids. So, and they're all different ages, right? Uh, yes. Okay. They're not stair steps. No. The, my youngest is 21 in June. I'm asking because I want to know what was the experience like with your oldest child, you know, reading or singing to them and engaging with them at that time versus your younger child? And has that, how has that changed? Uh, my oldest son, he sings. So I guess my singing kind of translated in his life. And my youngest daughter, uh, Kennedy, she is extremely articulate. So mm -hmm. um, I guess it played a part in her life too. And they didn't, you know, of course, Roddy back in the 80s, he didn't have the technology. And even though Kennedy does have the technology, she's more into working her brain through what she reads mm -hmm. and what she's uh, being exposed to. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit different. So, um, today's society is a little different um, just in terms of literacy. Okay. So that kind of tells me that between your children, no matter what age they are, you didn't change what you were doing. You I, did. I think I did. I don't think I emphasized technology. Okay. Yeah, uh, because all kids' personalities are different, so you have to kind of adjust to your right. kids' personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the approach, like you didn't play songs on your phone; you just sung to them the way you do. No, we me. didn't have phones that played music. We had pagers, and then we had flip phones. So. Technology wasn't as extensive as it is now. I, I'm, I'm telling my age. Okay, so... I, That's funny? Wow. Absolutely. It's, I'm <laughs> trying to stop from dying laughing. Right, right, right. But, <laughs> but um, mainly I'm asking because it sounds like you were consistent in what you were doing and engaging with your children and singing with them. Yes. Which... You know, help which helps them today as adults. Yes, with reading, with their literature, how articulate they are, the way they speak, and the way that they yes. respond to others. And that's why we have the book bash event every year because we want to display that to other parents right. to show them how easy it is, show them that you don't have to change your routine or what you're doing based on the times of today. The first perspective. Hello, this is Tina from the Whitlow Foundation. We are on DC in two perspectives during our annual book bash event at the 60 police station um, in partnership with the community engagement department with the police station, with the police department. We are so excited to be here. Uh, book bash is our annual event that we put on to celebrate Child Abuse Prevention Month during every April, and we like to make reading fun. We like to engage with kids through literacy and, you know, get them excited about reading and about books. So uh, we have Chef Lightfoot here today, and we have Miss Yolanda here. Her and her son are team, mom and son, um, partnership company, and they write books. Um, her son has wrote a series of books called The Adventures of Fireman that he's going to be reading. And Yolanda is, Miss Yolanda is here in support of her son. And also they're going to be showing, showcasing the short film based on his books as well. And she's going to be talking about their journey and also relating to youth through reading, through literacy. And Miss Yolanda is going to be speaking about how she does that as a mom, how she communicates with other parents and other moms to also get them excited about reading to their children, too. Hi, Yolanda. Hello. Hey, how old is Miguel? Miguel is 13. 
Oh, wow. A young author at 13. All right, got to listen up to that, guys. Mm -hmm. When did you notice that he was special? When he was a year old and... Let's make sure we define special because... Special meaning that he had a gift for writing and being an author. Well, as okay, so as far as that, well, Miguel started reading at three. And I didn't know he could read until he told me, because I would read to him every night. And he was like, Mommy, I know how to read. I said, no, you don't. He said, yes, I do. So I gave him a hard book to read, and he read the whole book. Really? And I was like, read it again. <laughs> and he read it again, and I was like, oh, my God. So we started calling everybody. He was like, Miguel, know how to read, know how to read. And it was on from there. Right, wow. Yeah. So, wow. And, and he was about, I think in the first, no, in kindergarten. He was reading chapter books. And then when he was in the first grade, he checked out the dictionary and mm -hmm. would read the dictionary every night. And I was like, oh my God. Pretty cool. And yeah. how did his school respond to that? Oh, they were awesome. They were awesome. When he was in pre-K four, uh, I reached out to his teacher. I said, well, you know, Miguel can read now. And I'm like, not no level one, level two books. He could like actually read. So she would send him to the kindergarten classes for um, reading and for math also. He's just very, very, very smart. So, so let me ask this question. Mm -hmm. As a parent, and the topic of our show is in two perspectives, give other parents your perspective on noticing that gift, that thing that Miguel found interesting okay. and you helped massage him. So, I am a former early childhood educator. So, no one really will. A lot of people know now, though. So, when I got Miguel, he was two months old. Um, I adopted him when he was two years old. I did not know that. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. I, we've met before. I'm sorry. To mm -hmm. The relationship that you have with Miguel is so natural. Yes. And that's how it should be. Yes. I wouldn't have never known that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I started reading to him, like, as soon as I brought him home, mm -hmm. I would read to him every night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a specific way that you have to hold a book. And I would read to him holding the book that way. So when he got old enough, he would just start reading the book. So what I tell a lot of parents, when you uh, check out books that have pictures in it, the pictures tell the story. Mm -hmm. So don't ever say that your child don't know how to read. They're reading. They mm -hmm. just don't know the words yet. Mm hmm but when they start looking at the pictures, they're actually saying the same words that are written in the book. And you'd be like, oh, oh my God, my child knows how to read. Mm -hmm. But children learn through repetition. So if you read that same book or those same two books every day, that child is going to end up knowing how to read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. How do you go about sharing with other parents your same practice that you share with, with your son? So... I guess me as a, being a former teacher, and I'm always in contact with children because I do uh, kids fitness. So when I'm with those parents, I always let them know that, you know, I'm a former educator. You know, I do early childhood intervention. So that's getting your little ones ready for school. And I also give them, you know, ideas um, on how to start getting their child ready for school as far as reading and math and everything. And sometimes I do workshops. Um, I may have daycares that call me and they want to do like parent workshops or do parent workshops. Miguel and I did a, a son and a mother and son workshop and I was so impressed by him. I was like, wait a minute, he's taking over. He did really good. And we were talking to um, moms and um, teens his, um, his age. And that's what I do. It's just amazing. <clears throat> uh, talking about learning something new. This. <laughs> I was, Tina was just laughing at me because I had tears in my eyes when you spoke about the fact that Miguel was adopted. And on the other side of what you spoke of, that was from a professional, um, because we all have our professional side mm -hmm. and we all have our personal side. Exactly. So from the personal side of nurturing someone mm -hmm. and it's not of your blood it's mm -hmm. not of your ilk that's something amazing that comes from the heart 
I love children. I've always loved children. That's why I went into early childhood. And I would tell my parents when they bring their children in their first day, when your child comes in here, they're my children. And I'm serious about that. I treat them all the same. I don't treat one different from the other. All the children, they learn the same, but they learn at different times. So everybody's not going to be on the same page. Some are a little bit advanced, and some are just right there. Some of them need a little help. So, But I treat all children the same. I never discriminate. I never have favoritism. And that's one thing that my parents um, loved about me. I ran into a student in the mall, and he recognized me. And he was like, Miss Yolanda. And I was like, who are you? He said, you don't remember me? I was like, he was like, Orlando. Like Orlando, he said, I'm going to tell you how you were my teacher. He said, because you had the little bug, the little blue beetle. And I was like, oh, I want to ride in that car. I was like, oh, my God. He was like, you know what? He said, I know I was bad. He said, but you were my favorite teacher. He said, because you always gave me hugs every day. Wow. Interesting. And I love stuff like that. Which can go a long way. Yes. Mm -hmm. He said, I will never forget you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so here's a question. I know Tina has some diagram questions, but mine mm -hmm. kind of come from off the cuff, it's just the way that I am. Um, in terms of literacy, coming from your perspective, mm -hmm. the professional, the parental, mm -hmm. what would you say are the defining um, characteristics of like our communities now mm -hmm. that should change the way parents look at reading and literacy. How do, how do you see that? How do I see that? That's a great question. So coming from a parent perspective, just starting to read, when you, I, I say read to your child from the womb. That's what I did. Read and sing to your child from the womb. Mm -hmm. And then when they come out, it doesn't matter how old they are. You read to them, period. You read to them, period. And you get them to love books. Build a library. Mm -hmm. My son has a library in his room. He has so many books that I had to give some away. And then you restock. You know, the older they get, you get um, books more, you know, geared towards their age. But, like, with my son, I have him, re we read together. So we get a book, and we read together uh, for an hour mm -hmm. every day. So that's something that's, you know, just you could do. Mm -hmm. So just go to the library. Go to the library with your child. But, you know, we find that <laughs> in everything that we do in our community, mm -hmm. I, I get in trouble a lot because of the things I say. The <laughs> effort that it takes mm -hmm. to make some of the things happen, mm -hmm. it's just that. It's just effort. Exactly. And a lot of, a lot of us um, don't practice that's effort. That's true. Because we true. think we, you know, we got more important things to do, or can't carve out time for this, can't carve out. Time you have for to that. make time. You have mm -hmm. to make time, and then events um, like this that you guys do. Because some children don't have books at home, mm -hmm. so. You so know. what do you say to parents who register for stuff like this mm -hmm. and then don't show up? And then don't show up. They're missing out. They're missing out because their children can learn a lot from another child. When Miguel speaks at uh, schools and when he goes and speaks at the schools and the kids learn that he's a published author and he's done so much stuff in his community, they're like, wow. You know, he's at like, you can age. do it. At, right, at the age. Like, he just won a $10,000 scholarship from Elio's Pizza. And <laughs> yes, in December. And so they came to his school and they wanted to show the kids that this is something that you could do. So they came and they presented, you know, the big cardboard check mm -hmm. um, to him. And they announced a lot of things that they do. He does. And they were like, Miguel does this? Because mm -hmm. he's just a, you know, regular kid. And they're like, oh, my God, we didn't know you did all this, Miguel. Mm -hmm. So they were so excited. I just have two more questions for mm -hmm. you. Do you find it difficult to encourage parents to read to, the, to their children early? Or what are the reservations that they have when you say things like that or when you share things like that with them? So I don't find it hard. Um, their reservations are that, just like I said earlier, that they can't read. But they just looking at the pictures. No. Mm -hmm. The pictures tell a story. Mm -hmm. 
And I tell him, I said, go back Let and read a book. imagination. It, mm-hmm. Right. You know, and I said, even if it goes off task, I said, they're using their imagination. I said, that's how stories come about. Miguel was eight years old when he wrote his first book. And me, you know, I was just like any other parent. I was like, oh, okay. And I just toss it aside. And then it wasn't until my girlfriend wrote her book. And I was like, oh, my God. I said, Miguel wrote a book. I said, well, let me read it real quick. And when I was reading it, I was like, did he really write this book? But I don't even know why I said that because of the type of child that I had. Mm-hmm. And when I sent it to her, she was like, girl, you need to send this to my publisher. Mm-hmm. When I sent it to the publisher, the publisher called me like, mm-hmm. wait a minute, I need to publish this guy. Mm-hmm. She was like, he's actually nine years old. I was like, yeah. She was like, oh, I need to publish him. Mm-hmm. So that's how that happened. And, and the further, that question that you asked is a little broader because we find that their barriers <clears throat> and challenges mm-hmm. are a deterrent for parents who don't have the education or exactly. The and I've themselves. had that issue before when I was teaching, and I did have one parent. She was like, "You know, I'm illiterate, mm-hmm. and you know, some I of need them are help." Afraid to talk about exactly, that. but with me, I'm the type of person that I make them feel comfortable. You know, to come to me. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, when you come in my class, it's a family. We're a family here. Mm-hmm. Don't ever be afraid to come to me mm-hmm. about anything. And it was during a, a parent-teacher conference when she uh, had mentioned that. And I was like, well, you know what? We have um, resources that can help you. I said, I'll even tutor you if you need me to, you know, to help you learn how to read. And, you know, she, I gave her those resources. She took advantage of them. Now she's reading. Mom. You know, has a job. I mean, mm-hmm. she's doing good. Has more kids, but her kids are smart and they're doing, mm-hmm. you know, very well. So, you know, and it, it, you were right about that. That's one of the reservations that some parents have because some of them don't have mm-hmm. the education. So, right. Mm-hmm. My last question, and then we're going to interview Miguel. Okay. I'm sure that Miguel may experience some pressure. You know, being on the platform that he's on and creating the movement that he's created, what do you say to him to keep him encouraged and to keep him up, uplifted in a positive way and at an age-appropriate approach? Okay, so let me just backtrack a little bit. When Miguel was in second grade and he was in a bilingual class, right, his teacher, whew, I pray for her, his teacher, she kind of discriminated <laughs> against the black kids. There was only six black kids in the class, and all the rest were Hispanic. And Miguel, he you know, had some issues that he was dealing with that we didn't know about at the time, but I knew something was going on, and she would blame him for everything. So his self-esteem had went down very low. And, you know, me as a parent, I don't play that. So I had to get on top of that with that teacher. Right. And she didn't know that I was an educator at that time. Yeah, so... You know, a lot of things went down. But when he got into third grade, you know, I took him out the bilingual um, program, and he went to another class in third grade, and that's when his life just, like, his self-esteem started coming back up. And I think what really made his self-esteem come up was when he met President Obama. Mm Mm-hmm. I saw that picture. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that was just, like, the highlight. He was like, I will never forget that. That's, like, the highlight of his life. Mm -hmm. So that was maybe about three months before we got his book published. And then he sent it to President Obama. He got that letter from President Obama. And President Obama was like, you know, he said, I enjoyed our time we had at the Boys and Girls Club. And Mm -hmm. I know that you're going to do great things, continue to do great things. And that's what really Uh, motivated him. Do you remember what that conversation was that made that transition? With him and President Obama? Yeah. So actually, I wasn't there. And it was another police officer there at the time. You was with Michelle? He had his, his whole family was there. No, you was oh, was, oh I wish I was. So they didn't tell the parents to come. They said, drop your kids off because, oh, yeah. you know, they didn't want to take the attention away from the kids. Mm-hmm. So it was actually, you know, President Obama and Michelle and Malia. And they said that he was so taken aback by Miguel. Like, who is this young man? Are you really nine years old? And he, you know, complimented Miguel, like, you're so intelligent, and, you know, I know you're going to do great things, and, you know, that just, like, really just, you know, put Miguel, like, over the top. You pat yourself mm-hmm. on the back for that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then when he published, when Miguel published his book, 
because we never knew he was going to be an author. He just wrote the book out the blue. It wasn't meant to be published. Right. But when I saw this, I was like, you should publish the book, Miguel. Right. I said, you know, you're not too young to do anything. It was anything. meant to be published. It God was. Had to align exactly, exactly. Out. So, I mean, it just went on from there. Mm-hmm. And then ever since then, it's just like blessings upon blessings upon blessings just been happening for him. Right, right. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> well, that's, that's a great conversation. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> insight into the mind and the world of a adopted parent, mm-hmm. adoptive parent, and an adoptive kid. I am. I'm taking it back. Thank you. What I never would have <laughs> thought that that was you know, two different worlds meeting. Mm-hmm. That that was from the same world, and that's just an amazing, amazing journey. And Thank one you. thing he just started opening up about is, you know, his challenges of having ADHD and bipolar. And no one will wow. never know. Wow. So he starts, when he does his speaking engagements now, wow. he starts, you know, talking about that. And then it makes other kids feel comfortable about it. They're like, wow, wow. You know, I'm dealing with that too. Wow. You know, and Miguel's just like, wow, mom. He was like, I inspired, you know. Yeah. And he loves when he does that. Yeah. I got one. And that, that inspired me <laughs> to ask another question. Does he use literacy? Because that's also, you know, mm-hmm. being an author mm-hmm. and a writer is actually an art form too. Right. Which we support. Right. Does he use that as a outlet? Yes. So he loves reading. He's always loved reading. And he'll get these ideas. So you're like, ah, oh, I think I want to write a book about my mental challenges. Mm. So that's in the works now. That's the next one you were telling me about. Mm-hmm, so tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about that. So it's basically how he overcomes his challenges and, you know, what I do, you know, to support him and how he has friends um, that also have the same issues and what they, you mm-hmm. know, do to, you know, not be a, a, a negative stigma because, right. you know, they try to put negativity. But, you know, I always tell him that your challenges, I say your, your, your mental challenges are your superpowers. Right. I said never think that it's a disorder. Mm-hmm. It's not a disorder. Mm-hmm. I said that's your power. Mm-hmm. I said it's so many people that have had those powers, they're so intelligent. He was like, you right, Mom. So he started looking them up. And he looks up his, dis- you know, looks up the, his superpowers. and like, oh, this is what I'm going through. This is what I'm going through. You know, every day not perfect. And I told him, you're not perfect at all. I said, God didn't make us to be perfect. I said, but you're who God wants you to be. Mm-hmm. So. That's amazing. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Alanda. You're welcome. Thank you. thank you for sharing everything we're so excited to help you to have you here thank you and i know that you're going to display a short series a Mm -hmm. short film of miguel's movie based on his books right yes and i also want to thank sixth district for taking an interest in miguel Mm -hmm. you know that his his and connecting connecting us us also Mm -hmm. so you know his his um his mission is to build relationships with law enforcement and the children because there's so much negativity you know, out there mm-hmm. as far as the law enforcement. So I think he's been doing a good job. Absolutely. And I thank you all, too. Thank you. You're welcome. The second perspective. Miguel, who Hello. is the author of the series, Adventures, The Adventures of Fireman. So tell us a little bit about your book. You are our feature for this event today. You're going to be reading a few of your books, right? Yes, yes, I am. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what The Adventures of Fireman is about and what inspired you to write that. Okay, um, so The Adventures of Fireman is about how uh, two young superheroes discovered they had superpowers and they used them to fight crime against their arch nemesis, the Destroyer and Bang. So these awesome. are also made up characters? Yes. Yes, I did. So you made up the characters, the story, everything? Yes. That is amazing. So how old are you again, Miguel? 13. Wow. And you, start, you started writing when? Eight. When you were eight? Yes. So, five years ago. so when did you realize that you had a gift? When um, I was about, let's see... When I, when I first published a book, um, I noticed that as I was writing in my bedroom, like the stories that I wrote, I realized that I'm a very great writer. 
So, um, and uh, my next book is about my other passion mm -hmm. that I really want to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the groups that you read to. Do you read to kids the same age as you, a little bit younger or a little bit older? Sometimes it's, it, it's very, it's like very of ages. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I read to uh, daycares. That's where I mostly read to, daycares and churches. Okay, okay. And tell us a little bit about how you relate to your peers that are the same age as you, through... How, how, how do they receive you? Mm -hmm. uh, they they act you? like I'm just a normal... Really? Type. Yeah. You're not like a, a star normal. author to them? Uh, yeah, I'm somewhat like that. But, like, <laughs> they don't give me... They don't uh, act like I'm some, some, like, celebrity. They just treat me like how I want to be treated. Oh, that's Just cool. like normal. Yeah. Right, 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 right. That's cool. Thank you. That's cool. So, so if if not for being an author, did you did you want to grow up to be something else? Uh, basketball. Basketball player. You play so, basketball too, right? Yes. Oh, so I'm sure you could beat him. So talk a little yeah, bit he's about a fake athlete. having the desire to play basketball, like most kids. Most kids have this passion to be in sports. Right. But your desire also led you somewhere else that you found could be a part of your life also. Yes. And how does that relate to if sports doesn't work out, you have something to fall back on? Uh, probably baseball or engineering. So engineering, being an author. And that's, yeah. that's, that's good for kids to know that they have options other than sports. Right. Right? Right, yeah. So, another question that I have. Well, you have, you're working on a new book right now, right? Yes. Okay, What's the name so of the book? It's supposed, well, we're doing a book on my little cousin, then one on, uh... Oh, my cousin Vinny. No. You wouldn't know about that. You're too young for that. Uh, uh, and then the next one will probably be basketball. I'm, yeah. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the story and about the about your book that you're writing now and what inspired you to write that book. Okay. So the book that I'm trying to write right now, it's called Eagle Girl. And um, it's basically like... Uh, what is, uh, I want to say, it was a girl on DC Comics, and it's related to uh, her, I think she, her name is uh, Echo, I want to say, Echo, yeah, and it's basically about, it's basically about um, how the girl is, like, as a kid, like, as a little child, she, um, she had the superpowers, and her father wasn't around to, uh, to like, basically follow, like, make her feel comfortable mm -hmm. and make her, well, my cousin right now, she, her father is with her, but I just wanted to make a, like, a strong storyline. Mm -hmm. So it's about how her father left her when she was about two. <clears throat> and she has this parasite in her uh, neck that makes her like so when people are in trouble she can just like hear like eagles can like like hear mm -hmm. and um, she'll just fly there and then her superpower will basically be like like sound like I don't know what it's called I think it's called when it's basically echo, like so the sound would get into their ears and then the sound would make them hip, hypnotize. Mm. And yeah, that's basically. So does it make them like hypnotize them and pause? Whatever well, they no, do, they will save them. 
she don't, she don't, uh, tell them to do like things, like, the, like say she does, she screeches and then she says be a cat, and then basically she won the fight. She's okay. like, so she's like, turn into a cat. yeah, they'll think they're a cat. Yeah, so basically, she, she's like a one. Basically, like in video games, she'll basically be a one-hit combo, cause like it'll just be straight. It'll just be like she'll be a cat. They'll tell it that she will tell them to be a cat, and then she'll just they'll just be a cat, and then she'll tell them to uh, follow that ball, and they'll just be out. And then she'll make them go to the dark hole. I like to read that when yeah. that comes out. Yeah. So would I. So would I. Interesting it's imagination. Hard to, it's hard to explain it because I'm not even halfway done. <laughs> That's the beauty of creating something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so so what, what would be your message to that 13-year-old who's uh, trying to figure out what they want to do in life? You're never too young to do anything. Follow your passion. Don't let nobody tell you that you can't do nothing. Anything you want, you can do. Unless it's not, it, it's bad. You can't be. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And one more question that I have. How does reading and writing um, connect with you as, is it a form of an outlet? Or, like, what is it? What does it actually do for you, reading and writing? Does it help you be more creative? It helps me think more. It helps me gather stuff in my brain. A creative thinking. Yes. Basically. And how do you help your peers with the same thing? Do you encourage them to read and write? I and never did, but I I encourage some of them. I'm not gonna say I never did. Okay. But, uh, some of my friends like to say. They say, I wish I had money like you. And I'll say, just read or write. Mm-hmm. You write something down. Do something. Mm-hmm. Publish your book. If you already have a book that you've written, then just publish it. Okay. And one last question. Tell us about your conversation with Barack Obama. Oh, we were talking about uh, college basketball at the time. Uh-huh. I think it was. Yeah, he's a big basketball fan. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about ba- college basketball. And uh, we and we were so we had to do. I think when we were talking, I had to uh, do like a college, a college. So our tables, uh, so different tables had different topics. Our college, our uh, topic was college. So in the in the little handbook, we had to uh, draw and write about the college. Oh. So and he found that interesting. Yeah, and he, he was like, uh, he he was like very shocked how smart I was right. at the time. Right. Because most eight year olds don't even know what college is. Yeah, yeah. And meeting with him and talking to him, how did that make you feel? Especially feel, after you sent him your book. That made me feel like I can do anything. Mm-hmm. Especially those words of encouragement that he gave me was very helpful. And what were the words? I don't remember. <laughs> it was like a long time ago. But they resonated with changing right. how you look at your life and pursuing your dreams. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you pass that same kind of encouragement on to other young persons. Yes. That keeps yes. the keeps this evolution of, you know, our youth going in the right direction. Yes. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps us up. Thank you so much, Miguel, for sitting with us and giving you your time. And I think you're about to get ready to read your book, right? Yes. Or one of them. Cool. Yes. Awesome. And, and one day I'm going to bring you uh, over and have you help me write my book. Okay. <laughs> Having these amazing kids... Uh, interact with reading and literacy has been phenomenal. Uh, If you have any kids out there that are not exposed to literacy or books as much as you would want them to be, 
You got to look around D.C. During the Book Bash event, we interviewed Miguel and his mom, Yolanda. Miguel has won over $10,000 in scholarships and has been a guest speaker at schools all across the country, sharing his story in front of his peers and also in front of organizations and other youth organizations as well. Think of all the possibilities, what, what literacy can do if you just take a chance. Listening to Miguel and his mother share their story, it was a very inspirational story. Miguel was a foster kid, and his mom adopted him at three months old. And the bond that they have now, you would not even be able to tell. And Miguel also shared how, Miguel's mother also shared how he has bipolar and has used reading and literature as an outlet to some of the challenges that he faced. At the Whitlow Foundation, our vision is to offer micro-scholarship awards in the forms of tools of the trade for the creative arts and culinary art forms to students who are attending an art institute or a culinary school ages 17 to 22 with the abilities, the passion, and determination who cannot otherwise secure the financial aid needed to make those purchases. We're here to introduce them to all options that will assist them in funding their creative education. We want them to succeed in a culinary arts program or an art institute to further their aspirations of becoming an artist or an accomplished chef. So we offer supplies and the monetary aid options that are not required to pay back to assist them in meeting their financial needs.